So it is 536. We are having some recording issues. Uh, just for council members, um, by statute, we do have to record all of our meetings. Uh, so your microphones still speak into them because they're recording even when they're not projecting. Um, so we'll need it for uh, the, the votes. Um, I will be able to have the microphone, so I guess during public hearing portions or if you have questions, we'll, you'll either have to shout really loud or we're gonna have to pass this microphone along. So um, it is 5.37 p.m., May 13th, 2024. So good evening, everyone. I'm Mayor Shelley Carlson. The Moorhead City Council welcomes public input on issues listed on the agenda or of general community interest, time and council permitting. Speakers are limited to three minutes each. If you would like to address the council during the meeting, please fill out a form provided by the city clerk and we'll call you up during the citizens addressing the council item on the agenda. Please state your name and if you are a Moorhead resident. If comments were submitted to the clerk prior to the meeting via email or phone, those comments will be entered into record. For more information on participa participation, please visit the council meetings page on the City of Moorhead website at moorheadmn.gov. We, the Moorhead City Council, collectively and with gratitude, acknowledge the sacred land the City of Moorhead has built upon. We acknowledge the people who have resided here for generations and recognize that the spirit of the Dakota Ojibwe, Métis, and all indigenous communities permeate this land. And with that, could I get a roll call, please? Ryan Nelson. Here. Matt Gilbertson. Here. Heather Niesmeyer. Here. Laura Caroon. Here. Deb White. Here. Larry Seljevold. Here. Sebastian McDougall. Here. Chuck Hendrickson. Here. Mayor Shelley Carlson. Here. And for those who are able, please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. City Manager Molly, do we have any agenda amendments? There are no amendments to the agenda, Mayor. Okay, there's no amendments. So moving on to the consent agenda, do I have a motion to, excuse me, approve the consent agenda? So move, Niesmeyer. Second, Karoon. So I have a motion by Niesmeyer, a second by Karoon. Um, any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? That motion carries. Moving on to recognitions and presentations. The first is the Moorheart Recognition for AARP Free Income Tax Assistant Volunteer Preparers. And I will turn this over to Ms. Lisa Bodie. You might have to get it closer to your mouth.
Thank you. Let's see here. Is this not on now? Thank you so much, AARP, for uh, all the work that you you do, um, and I'm sure it's a very, very appreciated by the individuals who are coming in to get that assistance, um, and particularly to Harold, who's done this for over 20 years. Can't imagine all the people that he's assisted and how appreciative they all are for his help. Um, moving on to the next um, item on the agenda is a presentation of the class of 2024 Citizens Government Academy and I will turn this portion of the agenda over to Assistant City Manager Mike Reitz um, and before uh, and I don't know Lauren where did you go Lauren and also to Lauren Taylor too who is an integral part of putting the Academy on <laughs> like you're cursed. <laughs> sure. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> See? <laughs> yes. All right. <laughs> anyway, well, we use those microphones for the. <laughs>
as an intern and did so well she got promoted she's in the parks department now as well uh, that's a well-earned title because she was pretty special to this program she uh, she put me in a position where I most nights felt like I was just kind of along for the ride she also noteworthy in the sense that uh, I believe we have a 100% graduation rate with, with this class. You have to attend a certain number of, of classes in order to make it, and, and uh, this class did it with, uh, with no problem, really. So. <laughs> they do look nice, but.
from Dan. has a green light so this we're gonna hope that that means that that's good all right and then last but last not least um, we do have a proclamation tonight and this is the official proclamation of older Americans month of 2024 So, whereas May is Older Americans Month, a time for us to recognize and honor older adults in the city of Moorhead and their immense influence on every facet of American society, and whereas through their wealth of life experience and wisdom, older adults guide our younger generations and carry forward abundant cultural and historical knowledge, and whereas older, adult, or older Americans improve our communities through intergenerational relationships, community service, civic engagement, and many other activities, and whereas communities benefit when people of all ages, abilities, and backgrounds have the opportunity to participate and live independently, and whereas Moorhead must ensure that older adults or Americans have the resources and support needed to stay involved in their communities, reflecting our commitment to inclusivity and connectiveness. And now, therefore, it be resolved that I, Shelley Carlson, Mayor of the City of Moorhead, Minnesota, do hereby proclaim May 2024 as Older American Month and call upon all residents to join me in recognizing the contributions of our older citizens and promoting programs and activities that foster connection, inclusion, and support for older adults. Um, which I see is extremely fail fitting, um, considering we just had a more heart recognition for AERP, um, providing uh, free income tax assistance to volunteers, and a number of our graduates now from the Moorhead Citizens Government Academy um, are individuals who um, would be considered older Americans in our community. So very fitting for tonight, uh, the proclamation. So moving on to approval of the April 22nd, 2024 meeting minutes. So I have a motion to approve the meeting minutes. So moved. White seconds. So Boot McDougal with the um, motion, White with a second. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right, that motion carries. Um, are there any citizens in the audience who wish to address the council at this time? 
any citizens of the audience who wish to address the council at this time. Seeing none, moving on to uh, public hearing. Uh, this would be a public hearing to consider reduction in public transit service hours on the Matt Bus and Matt Paris Transit to become effective July 1st, 2024. And I will turn this over to Ms. Lori Van Beek. And actually, before we do this, why don't we open uh, the public hearing portion of this agenda item? Do I have a motion to open the meeting? Second, Nelson. A motion by Niesemeyer, a second by Nelson. Any further discussion? See none. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. The motion carried. Uh, this is the public hearing portion of this agenda item. Go and go ahead, Ms. Van Beek. reduce that and, and decide not to, to eliminate service on Saturday from 8 to
um, from 9.30 in Council we only had 2,971 rides. At the same time, we have about 4,252 riders in Moorhead. And um, it runs higher on Saturday than during the weekday during those hours. So that is part of the reason why we wanted to implement Saturday um, service till 1015. Um, all of the comments that we received um, up until the packet went together it were provided in the packet. We summarized them um, and, and included them. Um, so we encourage um, people to read those. There are a couple pages, so um, I'm not going to read them here. Um, just summarizing them. Uh, we did get one comment from Paul Mott. He, he wanted to attend, but it was not feeling well tonight. So he asked me to share his comments um, it, because they were not in the packet. And that was, um, he said one of his main concerns is the number of events in Fargo and Moorhead that start at 7, 8, or 9 p.m. And these events are free and low price much of the time. But the ending of weekday service at 1015 means that many low or fixed income people like himself cannot attend these events because we cannot get home or at least within walking distance without paying exorbitant taxi rates. Similarly, people who cannot accept employment or shop or conduct business that lasts past seven or eight if multiple buses are required to get home. He believes that late hour rider statistics support the later service hours. So that uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions before you get comments or after. Thank you, Ms. Uh, Bambi. Are there any members in the audience who would like to speak to the, this issue um, as part of the public hearing portion of this agenda item? Any individuals who would like to speak on this agenda item? All right, seeing none, I would entertain a motion to close the public hearing portion of this agenda item. So moved, Nisa Meyer. Second, Karun. A motion by Nisa Meyer, a second by Karun. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, that motion carries. The public hearing portion of this agenda item is now closed. Um, any questions for Ms. Van Beek? Council Member White. Thank you, Mayor. Thanks, Lori. And I know we've, we've talked about this at MATBUS, and um, I do really appreciate that we're making progress on increasing the number of drivers, and I think it's important to get that information out there that, you know, some of this is just that we, we don't have enough people there to be able to drive the buses on the routes that we want, and, and, but we're finally making some headway there. Um, the two areas that concern me, one that we, we talked about this at a, one of the MAP bus meetings is, you know, one reason to cut back some of the hours was that it was mentioned that, you know, businesses are closing earlier. Um, we know we have a pretty severe workforce shortage in our area, and part of the reason that places started closing earlier, cutting back on their hours, is because they couldn't get the workers to stay open. But now by doing this, we're also, again, like it just further perpetuates that because people who maybe could work like a three to 11 shift or you know work these later night shifts, um, if they ha don't have their own um, transportation and they rely on public transit, then um, it further limits that. And so it's sort of, sort of this vicious cycle that we get in. And, and again, I'm hoping if, as we make headway with um, workforce or with the driver shortage that we can look at how we might better serve in terms of helping with that workforce shortage and um, looking at some of those areas where we really need to get um, people to good jobs. Um, but the other area that came up a lot, um, I've, I've had constituents even prior to this email me and I know that we had some um, folks who contacted us and then I can see in the feedback is looking at things like par paratransit. So I'm glad that we were able to um, to uh, you know uh, change the initial proposal for some of the cuts in hours, but um, but I also was just thinking I'd like to see us doing more to really get input on what's working and maybe what isn't working besides just all all of this you know um, the hours, but even beyond that. And so when you're getting public input, um, have we done anything where we specifically looked to get input from people who rely on paratransit? And of course. You know, um, for some of those folks, the way we might get input 
gather public input um, isn't as accessible to them. And so wh what are the methods that we're using and have we done anything specifically looking at those who rely on paratransit? Uh, for paratransit, um, we do send out periodic um, correspondence to them telling them about different things that we might be considering changing and asking for input. But we do not necessarily, um, I, don't, I don't think that we, we could say that we necessarily hold specific meetings for paratransit. Um, we do do annual survey, or not annual, we do surveys of our passengers and we are in the process of starting our five-year transit development plan in August. At that time, we do considerable outreach into the community with stakeholder groups and passengers and people with disabilities. Uh, we do a survey, but we also have, um, you know, meetings with different groups and, and ask for participation from our riders. So that process actually will be occurring really, you know, like I said, in August it starts. Um, we're gonna start it in, in this year, but in finish it next year, it's about a one year process. And that then will lead us for our five year plan for 2026 through 2030. So um, that is probably the most that we do for, for outreach. Uh, we can do individual surveys, um, sometimes the state asks us to do uh, customer surveys on how are we doing and how is performance. Um, and we do keep a lot of statistics to see how, how things are going. Um, prayer transit ridership has been increasing at a higher rate, I would say, than fixed route. And, um, and we have added more vehicles to the fleet. Um, we do still have that driver shortage, and so you know it does affect paratransit as well. Um, but I think paratransit is picking up faster as far as ridership goes. Any uh, other questions from council members? Uh, council member Nelson and then council member Niesmeyer. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Lori, just for our education, can you explain that, that 1015 end service? Uh, does that mean you have to be at your destination by 1015 or does that mean you have to start your, your um, you have to be on the bus by 1015? Can you, and then does it matter then if you have to change buses? Uh, can you explain just real quickly what that means? Uh, yes, so 1015 is when the last bus stops. So if you need to take several buses to get back home, you would have to start your planning of your trip earlier than that so that you're home by, you know, before the end of service at 1015. That would be true of both fixed route and paratransit. So depending on where you are in the community, um, that travel time does have to be computed into, into that last um, bus ending at 1015. Thank you. Councilmember Niesmeyer. Thank you. Um, Lori, oh, sorry, Ms. Van Beek, could you share, um, it's sort of what Councilmember White and Councilmember uh, Nelson were speaking to, that time from destination. I know um, some of the comments that um, I know I had received and perhaps my fellow co council member received is the concern and the reduction um, in a, a, a or restricts participation in the community. And I do appreciate um, the adjustment and keeping the Saturday hours until 1015. I think that does really expand opportunities in our community. But can you speak to um, uh, research, survey data, uh, materials that we have that we collect? I know it's coming perhaps in August, but that we do from point of starting your trip to ending your trip for paratransit riders or standard bus riders and do some uh, exploration of development? Uh, every three years we're required to do um, onboard surveys um, that compute passenger miles. And so um, during those we randomly select um, five trips um, a week and go in and actually either ride the bus or watch the video on board the bus to see where people get on and off um, on the buses. Um, and that it gives us passenger mile data of how far people are truly traveling. Um, that's, that data was done in 23 and our, and our average passenger ride has decreased um, in length. Um, I don't know if that is because of the service cuts in hours. Um, if the travel is just, they're going to fewer places so they can get back faster. I really don't have uh, anything to back that up, but it was a considerable change in travel pattern um, and noted when we did our annual federal report. Um, paratransit is door to door, so it's, um, it's harder to 
I mean, you can see the patterns very clearly there where people are going. I would say the majority of our trips are medical related um, and our peak times are work related peak times. Um, so I forgot what your question was, council member. <laughs> uh, the amount of time and uh, if we use some of that data to make improvements or adjustments or use it to impact the upcoming five-year plan and survey. Right. Thank you. So what we have is um, we have um, a new software package that is now being implemented um, and it is supposed to be complete and running in July so it's coming right around the corner it has automatic passenger counters on it as people get on and off the bus it will count the passengers right now we have where people board but we don't have necessarily where people deboard and that data then will be used by our consultant in our five-year plan to look at the patterns so in, in addition to doing a survey, it will look at the patterns of travel of where people are getting on and off. Um, and you know, part of that is, is just wanting to know where we don't go as well. And so it'll be a, uh, there'll be a survey of passengers and then there'll be a survey of people that would like to be passengers but aren't and why they're not. So there's a couple of elements to that. But the automatic passenger counter data is really good data for route planning and we're excited to have that coming up. Excellent, thank you, Ms. Van Beek. We're getting some interesting music in the background here. Um, I don't know where it's coming from. Uh, any other council members who have questions of Ms. Van Beek? Go ahead. I forgot to mention something. Paratransit also has a new software coming on board. It actually should be in place in June, so it's even earlier. And um, I think that, that people are going to really like it because if they have the ability to have it on a smartphone, they can have an app and book their own rides and see how long it'll take them to get to their rides. You know, how long will it travel time be? I think that will be helpful. It'll also remind them of their appointments the night before and tell them when the bus is 15 minutes out and tell them when the bus arrives. So there's some really good technology that's coming with those apps that I think will be much, much more helpful for passengers. Thank you. Any additional questions? All right, seeing none, I would entertain a motion to approve the changes in public transit service uh, hours for Matt Bus and Matt Paratransit. So moved, Niesemeyer. White seconds. Niesemeyer with a motion, white with a second. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, that motion passes. Thank you, Ms. Thank Wendy. you. And we do have another public hearing uh, related to proposals to adopt the redevelopment plan for the downtown Mora development project and to establish the tax increment financing plan for tax increment financing, district number 31. Do I have a motion to open the public hearing portion of this agenda item? So move, Niesemeyer. Second, Karun. I have a motion by Niesemeyer, a second by Karun. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, that motion carried. Public hearing portion is uh, this agenda item is open. I'll turn over to Mr. Derek LaPointe. Thank you, Madam Mayor and members of the council. Uh, it's an exciting uh, evening tonight here as we kind of look at our next step in the process for our downtown redevelopment project. <clears throat> and that is the establishment of the tax increment financing uh, district number 31 in our community. Uh, this also looks at the, the district itself, so the map. Uh, that's uh, in your packet, which I'll describe in a little bit, as well as a, a draft kind of uh, TIF plan that outlines a little bit of the project that you're um, uh, looking to accommodate here. So this is the City of Moorhead considering a, a tax increment financing district and the redevelopment area plan to assist with the financing of a portion of costs associated with the redevelopment of an approximately 19 and a half acre uh, area that spans nine city blocks. Uh, the new development uh, will transform the current site of the Moorhead Center Mall uh, built in the 1960s uh, into a redevelopment downtown area providing year-round amenities for residents and visitors to work, live, relax, learn, and be entertained. Uh, by creating an area fix uh, featuring mixed-use housing and retail, uh, recreation facilities, restaurants, uh, arts, uh, convenient parking, uh, the, establish will, the, the, the development will re-establish key streets and strengthen uh, connection to the river. Growth in this area will provide tremendous tax benefits for the city of Moorhead, uh, our county as well, and the state of Minnesota. So to establish a uh, tax increment financing, which specifically by state statute, we are looking at a redevelopment uh, tax increment financing district, 
at least 50 percent excuse me at least 50 percent of the buildings need to be considered substandards which we uh, worked with a consultant uh, Braun Intertech who did an analysis of uh, the Moorhead Center Mall site uh, as well as the U.S. Bank building which is another property that um, is included in this district as well so at least uh, 50 percent of those buildings need to be considered substandard by this uh, outside third party uh, TIF assessment and at least 70 percent of the area within the proposed district needs to be occupied by building streets sidewalks public lo uh, parking lots um, and similar structures so our uh, area does qualify per state statute for that uh, the TIF plan itself has been drafted utilizing assumptions relative to new development uses and anticipated construction timing. So we're really grateful to have uh, Baker Tilly, uh, Michaela Hewitt, who has uh, drafted so much of this document, as well as our city attorney, John Shockley, and our city leadership, who's been uh, highly involved with this process since day one and, and making sure that we're building assumptions that are not only appropriate for a financial perspective, but uh, the timing has to be appropriate that our market can absorb the amount of residential and uh, commercial that's gonna be going into this area as well. The district itself, um, in your packet, we have a map here. So we look at First Avenue to the north. Uh, that's our north boundary. We have 7th Street to the, to the east, 3rd uh, Street and 4th Street, kind of in that area on the, the west side. We have Center Avenue to the south, as well as a portion, as I mentioned, that has included the U.S. Bank building. Uh, we worked with Mr. Kevin Bartram here over the last couple of months. Uh, there was a willingness to be a part of the Tax Increment Financing District. We were able to work with Brown Intertech and have that project do the TIF assessment to make sure that it qualified for the substandard building. So that is the reason for that inclusion that you see here uh, today. The district itself, um, you know, we've gone through uh, a number of different uh, processes by state statute. So we've um, been notified. We notified the Clay County uh, board members as well as our, our public school board members as well. Uh, we have not uh, received comments. In fact, most of them um, have showed support for this project over the years. Was it actually able to present at Clay County a number of weeks back, and, and all of them showed support of this project as well. Um, just last week, we also are required to go through our EDA uh, and our planning commission. Each have defined goals by state statute that we need to get <laughs> approval for, and we receive unanimous approval from both EDA and planning commission on those items. Uh, and again, per state statute, again, because this is very much defined, it's a, it's a process that we need to follow for specifically a redevelopment, a redevelopment tax increment financing district. There are certain statutes that we need to uh, follow for uh, qualifications, and that is one, a TIF district qualifies as a redevelopment district, and that's how I mentioned the, the substandard buildings and some of the other uh, occupied buildings, et cetera. The proposed development in the opinion of the city would not reasonably be expected to occur solely through private investment with the, with, uh, within the foreseeable future. Uh, and that's something we've had lots of conversations with. This area is large uh, at almost 20 acres with complex, uh, complex land entitlement issues and um, issues that uh, needed to be rectified before building development could occur. And certainly public infrastructure that needs to occur. Thirdly, the TIF plan would afford a maximum opportunity consistent with sound needs of the city as a whole for the development of the project area by private, private enterprise. And then lastly, the TIF plan conforms to general plans for the development of the city as a whole. So uh, in short, that means consistent with our, our downtown master plan that was done in 2020, uh, as well as our city comprehensive plan that followed a couple years after that. Uh, so. Again, that was uh, items that our, our Economic Development Authority and our, um, our Planning Commission uh, looked at uh, just over the last couple of weeks here. I'll just say the, the last thing, and, and really in simple terms, what this does is, one, it creates a boundary, as I mentioned. So we have a defined boundary of where this tax increment financing district is. And then secondly, with this uh, project boundary, it locks in a base value of the, the increment that can be uh, derived from that area. So we can start moving forward with projects, which is the exciting part. So uh, as immediately after you know, the council considers this, uh, we're able to process um, applications such as our Mr. Kevin Bartram's uh, United Sugar parking lot uh, project and the mixed use project that he has. 
he is not able to break ground. He certainly could break ground um, in this current state without it, but we would not be able to capture that increment because value would be created on the site. So that's the importance of, of the process that we're uh, establishing here today is one, defining that boundary, and then secondly, locking in that base value so we can start gathering increment as we move forward over the next several years of redevelopment. With that, I've said a lot. Uh, and there's a lot, as I mentioned, with, uh, with the Minnesota State Statute as it relates to TIF, but we're extremely excited to take this to the next uh, level uh, and see some uh, development occur here on this site. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Point. Are there any members in the audience who wish to speak to this agenda item? Again, are there any members of the audience who wish to speak during the public hearing portion of this item? Seeing none, I would entertain a motion to close the public hearing portion of this agenda item. So moved, Karun. Second, Niesmeyer. Uh, Karun with the motion, Niesmeyer with the second. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? That motion carries. Any questions of Mr. LaPointe? Uh, Council Member Seldable. Uh, Mr. LaPointe, you know, on page 25, it says the developer has indicated in communication with the city and submitted financial data that development of the proposal would not move forward without tax increment assistance. Um, I'm not trying to get into the weeds, but I mean, is that, is there are guidelines or some deal that it says like, I, or is it uh, percentage of what they investment or how is that determined? Yeah, and, and I should say too, so this is, again, the first step in the process. So when it gets into the use of the increment and the, the actual um, description of how these, these kind of funds can be utilized, there's a, a lot larger master development agreement that needs to be completed with a developer. So um, these are some general languages. Obviously, we're looking at the, the cost. There's been uh, um, uh, what we call TIF runs by Baker Tilly that looks at the increment that be gain, uh, can be gained, but also that looks at uh, the amount of uh, site preparation costs, the demolition, the site work, uh, the public infrastructure. So we're looking at those timings of it to see how much increment can be available for, for uh, development. Um, but yes, we work closely with the developer. Um, there'll be much more detail on, on how those funds will be used uh, and, and for council consideration at an upcoming meeting. Member White. I just really have a question more than a comment. I'm just I'm I'm happy to support this and I'm glad it's moving forward and I think it's just you know this we've got a lot on the line here. This is I think the mayor has said this this will be the largest public uh, largest uh, uh, development project that we've ever had in the history of Moorhead and um, I think we should look for all the tools in the toolbox that we can use and I think this is a really valuable one particularly when you look at the the amount of public infrastructure that needs to be put back in there. It's, it's you know, exciting to think about the ghost streets that are now gonna come back to life that, you know, that we haven't had there for years, but to ask the developers to take care of all of that to, you know, it would be, um, it's already very onerous. And so to just to be able to have those partnerships so we can work together with them to make sure that this project goes well, um, I think is um, really valuable. And it's exciting, I, I, you know, I've shared this with the council before and, and many members of the public, but we are truly creating a neighborhood and that's, that's exciting. Not many communities have the opportunity to do that. Um, and so we do have to do it in a, in a wise way, in a, in a way that uh, creates flexibility for not only the city, but for the development community as well, that provides a mix of opportunities for folks. So it is an exciting time. Um, I, I don't know if I can and cannot share this, I'm probably looking at Lisa, but we do, um, we have this TIF plan right now written in a way that uh, conforms with Minnesota State Statute, which may, means that there's a five-year TIF rule, um, which means we need to capture that increment within five years. Now, when these TIF laws are put into place, it's really looking at one-off kind of project, so one mixed-use building or one project that maybe has two phases. We're looking at 10 uh, mixed-use phases here, so it's a large, uh, complicated project. Um, we did do testify. We did testify at the House and the Senate, and both uh, uh, our requests are being considered right now for a five-year extension to that five-year TIF rule. So, looking at a ten-year time period, which, um, again, if we can't get through this year, we certainly are going to be coming back to Minnesota legislation. But it is looking uh, positive that we're going to be able to get that extension, and uh, we, we certainly need that just based on the amount of work that needs to be done in the site. Any further questions? 
Council Member Gilbertson. Thanks, Madam Mayor. Uh, thanks, <clears throat> Mr. LaPointe. Um, when I saw that you carved out U.S. Bank building, what's the what's the plan for A Street south of center, A Street to Fifth Street? Uh, so as far as infrastructure going south on Fifth Street, there? No, like you know, south of Center Avenue. Yep. From A Street to Fifth Street. Yeah. So this will only look at the U.S. Bank building and the and the parking lots that surrounds it. So, again, <laughs> working with Mr. Kevin Bartram um, and knowing that project's looking to be slated here in 2025. Um, you know, TIF law uh, looks at uh, continuous properties. So, being that a property is being redeveloped within a reasonable time frame, um, there was value to to capture that increment to help with the overall infrastructure. But there will be no um, infrastructure from a, a public uh, street standpoint or utility standpoint on Center or uh, Fifth Street. It's mainly going to support the overall plan, plans, which could be. You know the public plaza. Uh, certainly, the the infrastructure could be supportive of uh, uh, public parking that gets put in these new mixed use buildings. So there's certain parameters that we have to use the increment for per state law, um, but it really came down to timing uh, and our development partners working together and um, seeing a connection of adding that property as we uh, look to establish. So down the road, there'll be something probably south of center then. Well, there'll be a project, but I don't think that, if I'm understanding your correct, uh, question correctly, there won't be an, an extension of this boundary any further. So what we have on, on the map right now is kind of what we have defined as the project area. So if there's other projects that happen that were further uh, east on Center Avenue, south and east, or you know, even just uh, like the Wells Fargo building, for example, et cetera, uh, those would be qualified under their own uh, district or a, another one of our incentive projects, which could be the Renaissance Zone or something else. Yep. Council Member Hendrickson. Uh, thank you, Mayor Carlson. You might have mentioned this, Mr. LaPointe, but what's the time frame, the next steps? I'm, is it within six months, a year? Kind yeah, about that. it's a great question. Um, you know, obviously there's been a lot of change on the site already, uh, and we were able to do that, um, again, following state law to be able to initiate some um, pre-demolition before the district was created. Uh, so we worked with Baker Tilly that was brought before council um, a number of months ago. Uh, with the establishment of the district here today, uh, again, that sets that base value. So we can see uh, Mr. Kevin Bartram's project start, which uh, we're anticipating to happen here within the next uh, month, um, maybe sooner. Uh, we also, uh, this won't gather increment, but the Library Community Center is looking to break ground on June 5th, uh, so that's another project. The, the big thing, what it really does is it establishes some certainty that the project's moving forward. Uh, so when we're working with development partners, uh, we now have a preliminary plat that looks at identifying exact dimensions of these new lots that are going to be put in. We've been working uh, extremely hard with our engineering department on laying out the, the roads and the widths that are necessary. Uh, so it gives that certainty that we can move forward. Uh, again, referencing that this is just a next step in the, in the process, establishing the district is not certifying the district, which is a whole other process that we have to do, which we intend to do by 2025. So that's a, another uh, uh, checkbox that we need to get done from the state standpoint. But in all indications, that will be on track to start and, and, um, and get that certification here in 2025. But again, it's all coming down to certainty. Um, locking in that base value so we can start gathering some increment as we move forward. Um, it would be nice to see things going vertical instead of horizontal. So Yeah, 100%. And, and you know, to get even more in-depth with that, too, and um, it, it's really important how we plan this project, right? It's, uh, I, I honestly believe two to three projects a year on that site is probably the most um, our region can handle uh, when you look at market absorption. So we got to be smart. We've been working with you know, all of our development partners on what's the, the appropriate amount of units and, and amount of commercial square footage that we can bring online. Because uh, the last thing we want to do is, is, is build something and then it sit vacant. And we don't want that to happen. We want something that's viable, that's going to be uh, filled and, and lively and, and generating that kind of life that we all want to create in this vision. So, um, you know, I think that's, that's the next step is kind of creating phasing in these milestones, which you'll see in a, in a further development plan. Um, that really looks at the, the appropriate market absorption from a timing standpoint in this area, too. Thank you. Thank Appreciate you. it. Any additional questions? 
Seeing none, I would entertain a motion uh, to approve the resolution establishing the downtown Moorhead development project. So moved, so moved Nelson. Wait seconds. Unless um, you already have seconds. Well, we have two motions, so. Councilmember Nisamari, you've gotten a lot of motions tonight, so I'm going to give you the second. I'm going to give the motion to Councilmember Nelson. So, a motion by Nelson, a second by Nisamari. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? That motion carries. Thank you this all. Is very, very exciting. It is. It's a big, big day for Moorhead, so thank you all. You know, this is one of the ways that we are recreating that that downtown that we um, are all looking forward to having in Moorhead a place to go. Right. Yes. yes, moving on. Is it mayor and council reports? All well, the other rest are the consent. Okay. Um, mayor and council reports. Any council members have reports from boards and commissions? Council member Kroon. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I was able to attend a couple of events over the last few weeks. Um, April 26th, um, I was invited to speak to admitted students at Concordia and I got to share all about Moorhead and the great community that we live in um, and invite them to enroll for college and stay here. Um, also April 30th, um, I got to fill in for the mayor at the Sanford Community Breakfast with leaders from all across the region to hear updates on the work of the Children's Hospital. So that's it for me. Okay, thank you, Council Member uh, Karun, Council Member Niesmeyer. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I'd like to start by congratulating the second um, class of Citizens Government Academy um, participants. I had the opportunity of participating last year and it was outstanding. I know for a fact that Lauren and Mike did a fantastic job and I love you wearing your gear and getting your certificates tonight. I hope your um, knowledge of the city um, is infectious and encourages others to participate in the Citizens Government Academy, share that knowledge, as well as encourage others to um, enroll in the Citizens Police Academy, which starts this fall. I know I've met some of you uh, participating in the Citizens um, Police Academy, but we have two really great programs, um, one in the spring and one in the fall. So look for that application in July or August um, from the Moorhead Police Department. Um, I had the opportunity on May 1st to participate in two events that were held at the Moorhead Public Library. Um, one was How to Run for Office from West Central Initiative and the League of Women Voters of the Red River Valley. Um, you can look to um, the West Central Initiative's website for a variety of um, more information and upcoming great events for Run for Rural, which is really great because we are considered a rural um, community, uh, part of the West Central Initiative, and we can all take um, great advantage of the resources that they put out so we can get involved in our government. People can also check out the um, League of Women Voters of Red River Valley's website to get information about candidate forms and information about getting involved in our community. Um, there's more information on vote 411.org as well as their individual website. Um, the second um, session was also on May 1st at the Moorhead's um, library, um, which a shout out to the Moorhead Library for keeping all of the rooms going at the same time. It was pretty awesome. Um, they had a prairie garden workshop that was hosted by the United Prairie Foundation. The United Prairie Foundation has partnered with some of our own city staff to do prairie plantings throughout the city of Moorhead and I appreciated them hosting one at our local Moorhead Public Library for free for citizens to get information and to leave with seeds for um, planting their own uh, prairie gardens on their own land. Um, the uh, Cass Clay Food Partners are in the process of doing strategic planning and so if you participate at all in any shape or form in the food system, um, please um, check out their strategic planning survey that they sent out to their action network, as well as their Cass Clay Food Commission um, network, um, and submit that by this Thursday, May 16th. Um, that a strategic planning survey will actually help us move forward and make plans for what we can do in the future. My last update is for the longest table. The longest table, if you haven't marked your calendars already, is Thursday, June 27th at M State. 
Um, we are looking for um, volunteers, donors, both for regular funds, but door prizes as well. Those volunteers can be people who help out with greeting folks, hosting tables, a variety of things. And so that event is again, Thursday, June 27th in the evening. We share a meal and have a fabulous time. So if you would like to be involved at all, uh, in any way, shape or form, I encourage that you check out the Longest Table Moorhead, um, Dilworth and um, their website uh, and the Facebook page have information for how you can get involved. Thank you. Any other council members have uh, reports from boards or commissions? We've right, seen none. Um, the last couple of weeks I have been involved in a number of activities. Um, first and foremost, we'd like to extend a congratulations to uh, Michael Burns, uh, architect firm. They had their 40th anniversary, 40 years in the city of Moorhead, and also to Moorhead Plumbing and Heating uh, for being in the city of Moorhead for 100 years, an entire century. So congratulations to both of them. Um, I got to eat well at both of those events. Uh, the Chamber also had a number of events. <coughs> One was the Chamber Women Connect, um, working together as uh, different generations, and so I was asked to be on a panel um, representing my generation and how uh, it's beneficial to work and how we can learn from uh, the generations that come before us and also the generations that are coming after us. Um, it was one of their most well-attended events that they've ever had um, from the chamber. Uh, Moorhead, uh, the chamber also uh, sponsored an eggs and issues with military personnel. Uh, so we got to hear from, I don't believe he's a colonel, I'm trying to, a major, uh, Major Henderson <coughs> from the Moorhead Armory. And they are redoing the armory and they will be um, having a ribbon cutting sometime this fall. So um, they stay tuned to uh, attend that ribbon cutting. They will be inviting, uh, obviously, members of the council, but also other uh, entities and agencies and individuals throughout the fargo Moorhead community. Um, at the library, I, I got to participate in uh, League of Women Voters on how to run for public office um, with myself and Council Member Wade and Council Member Hendrickson. Uh, we didn't have a large group, but the, uh, the small group that we had was very engaged and we had some really good conversations. Uh, ESL students at the um, English as a Second Language adult students at Moorhead Vista. Um, I had an opportunity to speak to them and it was very gratifying to hear um, and I was very proud to hear how, felt, uh, how well they ex felt accepted by the city of Moorhead and they also were very appreciative of the different types of services that um, are, are given to um, the citizens in, in the city of Moorhead. We also had I also had three people who stayed afterwards to talk to me about how to open a business in the city of Moorhead. I, I find that um, our new Americans, our immigrant community, are, they have a very entrepreneurial spirit. Um, and one young lady who is attending, I believe, MSUM right now, wants to open a cake business. She showed me her cakes that she makes. And it was something that should be on the baking show. It was absolutely beautiful. Um, the other um, report was I wanted to give a shout out to Miss Lisa Bodie and also Mike Edinburgh, who is from Magnify Financial. The two of them and myself spoke to a large group of realtors about all the different, uh, different lending opportunities for people who would like to uh, purchase or build a house in the city of Moorhead. Um, Mike did a fabulous job. He put a lot of time and effort into it. Um, and asked a, or answered a lot of questions from the realtors, so I'm hoping that that gets more information out there about the different types of programs that are available. And then last but not least, um, the Red River Valley Dispatch bids are um, now out and available um, for the different components that will be going into our new dispatch center. So stay tuned on that as bids come in, um, either myself or Council Member Nelson will keep everybody posted on that, and I think a huge list here today. I believe that was it. So, turning it over to you, City Manager Molly. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, this is working good. 
so I just want to recognize, thank, congratulate the, uh, everybody that was part of the Citizens Government Academy. I, I'll say you know, over 25 people, 100% participation is just absolutely incredible. Um, thanks for you know, Mike and Lauren for putting it on. And, but everyone that came out and the level of engagement, I'll say you know, we were there for the last night for the mock council meeting and to review the finances. That's uh, when, when folks are still engaged and having fun at that point, you've made it a long way. <laughs> so that is really super. And thanks for hanging out to the end of the meeting tonight. It was really great. So I um, hope we get to work together more. And, and please know that the next step in this whole process is uh, you know, the benefit of fresh eyes and listening and observations that you have. I hope you'll share them with us too. So uh, pool season is opening uh, Friday, May 31st at 1230 uh, in the afternoon. And um, this includes the neighborhood wading pools. So uh, really something that's kind of unique and special to Moorhead and people that, that, that's really exciting. And I know uh, folks of all ages really enjoy it. And that's coming up in just a couple weeks. And all are invited to uh, attend the inclusive playground ribbon cutting on May, Thursday, May 30th at 1.30 at Southside Regional Park. I don't know if anybody's been by to check out that new inclusive playground, but it is incredibly busy. There are lines. I had a friend, she said that uh, she had brought her grandchild to uh, play soccer and uh, didn't want to leave the park for the game. So that's how great that park is. But, so there's a ribbon cutting, so that'll be, that'll be happening along with the natural playground in June and the groundbreaking for the uh, community center and library. So more on that as well. All right, thank you, City Manager Molly, and thank you for clarifying the pool opens at 12.30 in the afternoon, not 12.30 in the morning. <laughs> uh, we don't want people there at midnight. Um, moving on, we do have an executive session tonight, so I would be um, open to entertaining a motion to go into closed executive session pursuant to Minnesota Statute uh, 13D.05 subdivision A for the purpose of conducting the city manager's annual performance evaluation. Do I have a motion to go into closed session? So moved, McDougal. Second, Soldable. We have a motion by McDougal, a second by Soldable. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? All right, we are in executive session. I feel silly using this, but I'm going to because it's here. So, uh, do I have a motion to close the executive session? So move, Nelson. <laughs> second, Nelson. Motion by Gilbertson, second by Nelson. Any discussion? See none. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. The executive session has been closed. We do not have any new business, um, so we are adjourned. So it's 7:38, 7:39 actually. So good night, Morehead.